And as Brian said, I'm the director of the Coral Center for Media and Information Policy. That center is named after a, an MSU alumnus who served on the major federal regulatory body, the Federal Communications Commission, for 23 and a half years, second longest person on that commission. But you may ask yourself, what does the center that focuses on policy and governance uh, have to do with the Games Conference? And there's many touching points uh, that, uh, that one could find, actually. One of them, of course, is that, that the games industry has repeatedly and all and off been subject to the wrath of policymakers. And, uh, and, uh, and it's, you can expect that as we move to, you know, we envision this future of virtual reality metaverses or whatever those, uh, those environments might be, that there will be renewed discussions. And uh, we construe the notion of policy very broadly speaking. We're not just looking at government policy, but we're also looking at, at the the norms, the conventions that emerge out of uh, uh, self-organized communities, such as communities of gamers. But we, look, we also look at code, uh, the technical sort of uh, uh, infrastructure of, of, of how we interact online as a, as, a, as a governance mechanism. And we try to understand how these tools of governance influence individuals, communities, outcomes uh, of those systems. So what the talk this morning that was very close to, to the types of issues that we face. How can we perhaps influence the game mechanics, the individual behaviors, uh, the economics of, of, of an environment to achieve outcomes in a world that is inherently interconnected, evolving, continuously moving to something else, continuously metamorphosing to the next state. It's open-ended. And policy has a very difficult uh, uh, time to actually deal with those issues because policymakers want to project the sense that they are in control, they can fix things. And that's sort of the internal logic of policymaking. So, as a result, unfortunately, frequent, frequently policymaking is based on very simplistic, half baked mental models and explanations of how the reality that we're dealing with works. Um, one such simplistic model are moral panics, right? They kind of drive, uh, drive people to, to action uh, in kind of strange ways. And I'm really happy therefore, to, to welcome uh, this afternoon Rachel Covert, who has made it uh, as one of her missions in her recent uh, YouTube channel to bridge the gap between these moral panics and scientific knowledge, to really contribute to inform the discussion that we have uh, on, on those issues. I, I don't have to read all the things that are in your program, but she's She's a research uh, psychologist. She, she's the research director of Take This, which is a nonprofit organization uh, seeking to um, promote awareness of mental health issues in the game industry and, and, and uh, advance the cause of that. Uh, she, she, she has published multiple books, some peer reviewed in a more of an academic uh, community, others for the general public, for communities. She is a strong media presence and she's a pleasant presence. Period. So, welcome uh, to Rachel Cohen, please. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I love he's like, she's pleasant. We're talking about hate. societal repercussions for the normalization of hate in gay spaces. Um, as mentioned, I am here, thankfully, on behalf of the Quello Center. They invited me to come and talk. If you're not familiar with them, they are a center that focuses on policy and communication and information, and I'm really grateful that they asked me to come. And I hope that the talk sparks some discussion among all of us about media and information and policy. So I did have a lovely introduction, but we all have these slides. And if you know me, <clears throat> you know I have a healthy obsession with The Witcher, and I had to get one in. So here it is. It's hard to get in a talk about hate. Um, I'm a research director at Take This. I am a science content creator. There's the link if you are a YouTube person. Um, I'm also a passionate mental health advocate, uh, often a Twitter soapboxer, and a proponent of games as tools for mental wellness. If you're not familiar with Take This, or a mental health nonprofit, uh, the first actually to form serving the gaming industry and gaming communities. 
We aim to destigmatize mental health challenges and provide mental health information and support to the gaming community and also the gaming industry. So I'm in a really unique kind of position that we really bridge the gap between game makers and game players. Before we get started, um, this talk is going to contain some things that may be distressing. Um, here are some of the things it will contain. Um, examples of hate speech, online harassment, workplace harassment, some offensive language. We're going to talk briefly about suicidal ideation, post-traumatic stress disorder, and white nationalism. If any of this is upsetting, please feel free to step away. Okay, so on my intro slide, I mentioned that I am a proponent of games for tools for mental wellness, which I am, but today's talk is focused more on the darker side of things. Over the last couple years, my research has really pivoted, looking at things like hate, harassment, toxicity, extremism, and radicalization. All of these things I'm going to be talking about today. Specifically, I'm talking about the normalization of toxic behavior and toxic gamer cultures in gaming spaces, and how this normalization has broader societal repercussions beyond the virtual walls of our digital playgrounds. So toxic gamer cultures are nothing new, and honestly, I feel like the phrase toxic gamer culture is almost a bit cliche, we say it all the time. Um, but if we're gonna talk about it today, which we are, we first have to define it, as any good academic would. And if you put it into Google, uh, you'll find there's no real clear definition. So I tried to take the best of all the things I could find and kind of create an all-encompassing definition of toxic gamer culture, which is a set of culturally justified behaviors within gaming communities that are harmful to other players within and outside of gaming spaces. And I think really the key component here is about the culture of acceptance. It's about the normalization. It's about the being culturally justified. And that's the focus today. We're going to explore this normalization and look at how the normalization of hate, harassment, sexism, misogyny, everything that would fall under the umbrella of toxic gamer culture has wider societal repercussions. So this is how we're going to get there. First, we're going to establish a shared language. What even is toxicity in gaming spaces? I told you I found a million definitions. I was not lying. <laughs> There's a lot of different opinions of what falls under the umbrella. Uh, then we're going to talk about this idea of normalization. Are toxic behaviors actually normalized, or do we just perceive it to be that way? Um, and we're going to look at prevalence rates um, in, in relation to that. Then we're going to talk about impact. What is the impact? Who is it impacting and how? Is it just me because I'm a, a female with a really bad frag uh, rate? Or is it you know, for everyone? Are there more issues at play? And lastly, solutions. How do we denormalize toxicity in these spaces? if it is indeed normalized. So, starting from the beginning, the what. What is toxicity? Now, the working definition I use is toxicity are the outcomes of behaviors done directly against another person within the gaming space that causes harm. So we're talking specifically within gaming spaces. So the intention doesn't matter, it's the outcome that matters. If you want to really get into the nitty gritty, trolling tends to be the behavior for, uh, tends to be the word for behaviors that are intentionally meant to cause harm. And toxicity is just the broader umbrella term. Um, for any behavior that causes harm, regardless of intention. Toxic behaviors can be conceptualized on two spectrums, two axes, verbal to behavioral, and transient to strategic. A verbal action is one that is expressed verbally by a, a chat or voice, uh, voice chat or text, one person to another, and that's it, it stops there. A behavioral action can start as a verbal one and then trigger a behavioral action, something like stopping. Um, it could also be um, something like Indian cheating that would be considered a behavioral action. The other axis is transient to strategic. Transient is an action that happens in the moment, something like trash talking, where strategic implies the individual's time to strategize and, and do the behavior. So again, that might be something like stalking. Now it's important to recognize the difference in these axes because where the behavior lies on these two spectrums greatly impacts the impact that it has on the victim of the behavior. So this is a list of toxic actions. It's certainly not the only list that exists, um, but it's my list <laughs> from a 2020 paper that I, I published called Dark Participation, where I was trying to establish this shared language. I was trying to collate all this information we have and how can we have a shared language to talk about this topic in a productive and fruitful way. And you can see that there's the spectrum, verbal to behavioral, transient to strategic, Generally speaking, the actions that are verbal and transient tend to be thought of as more mild than the behaviors 
that are behavioral and strategic. So trash talking would be verbal transients, putting down others, uh, making fun of others, whereas doxing, publicly sharing personal information, right, that is going to be behavioral and strategic. It is more likely to have severe and long-term negative mental health impact on the victim. And research supports this exact um, example. We see that trash talking has less of a long-term psychological impact, whereas doxing can have severe, significant long-term impact, including post-traumatic stress disorder symptomology. So knowing and understanding that there is a spectrum of these different kinds of dark participation is key, and realizing that the upper end of the spectrum is more severe, um, mental health repercussions, these behavioral strategic actions, as compared to the verbal transient. However, it's also important to understand that all of these actions contribute to what we're calling toxic gaming, toxic gamer culture. They all contribute to normalization of bad behaviors, dark participation occurring in gaming spaces. They're all part of those spaces. Is it normalized? So we know what it is. Is it normalized? There's certainly the perception that it's normalized. Um, this is from uh, the news. We see here, in the, it's a Wired article. It says, players often rationalize behaviors like harassment as part of video game culture. They rationalize it as part of the culture. Here's a 2022 article, gamers are terrible people and we should stop being okay with it. Um, again, assuming a normalization, assuming we've had this acceptance, we should stop being accepting of it, even though we are currently accepting. Um, I don't think gamers are not for us. Um, as noted by game designer Brown Wu, this is a Washington Post op-ed, the quote says, the game world is thrown, thronged by misogynists and racists who feel free to advocate harm against anyone who's not like them. And then we see discussions of normalization and scholarly work. Um, this is talking about the gaming industry specifically. It says companies who make the games that players consume are fundamentally toxic within an organizational structure, and the games they create can often represent and reinforce the toxicity. So they're speaking here a bit of a perpetuating cycle, which we are going to talk about a little later in the talk, but it's about a toxic culture that's breeding toxic content and turn breeding toxic communities. It's normalized within the organizational structure. Then there's Reddit. Um, you know, we see these discussions uh, among the community, right, on Reddit. So it says, why is toxicity in online gaming communities accepted? Why? Um, now, one of my favorite quotes about the normalization of behavior comes from a book from um, Christopher Paul called The Mediocrity of Video Games and Why Gaming Culture is the Worst. It's my favorite quote. Although the world is full of jerks and the internet is full of jerks, one can certainly make an argument that some of the jerkiest are found circulating around video games. <laughs> Um, a few paragraphs later, it's a great book, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend. Um, a few paragraphs later, he continues, the common discourse and actions that have become normal, routine, part of the environment around video games is troubling. And it really is. Um, here are some recent numbers around hate and harassment. This comes from the 2021 report from the Anti-Defamation League. To start, they report five out of six adults who play multiplayer games in the U.S. experience some form of harassment playing games online. So these are players who are 18 and up. Among younger players, age 13 to 17, the number is three out of five. So already we're seeing that harassment in games, experiencing it is the norm and not the exception. And this could be anything we saw on the spectrum from before, from trash talking to toxic that didn't differentiate. <clears throat> Of those who experienced harassment, three out of four, uh, 71%, experienced severe harassment, which included physical threats, stalking, and sustained harassment. So 70% of all harassment was severe harassment. They also found two out of three adults believe that laws should be created, we're talking about policy, and laws should be created to increase transparency around how game companies address hate harassment and extremism. And we will talk about that. Um, so here are findings from the 2021, 2021 paper I mentioned earlier about dark participation. And again, you see all these kinds of incidences of dark participation, trash talking, contrary play, inhibiting team, aiding the enemy, verbal spamming and griefing. Blue is directly experienced. Orange is witnessed. Um, it's, it's common course. It's, it's very common for people to experience this. More the norm than the exception. Um, and it's also true for extreme forms, sexual harassment, hate speech, and violence. Again, experienced in blue and mixed in orange. So the sheer normalcy of these behaviors has led to the perception, and I would say honestly the reality, that gaming spaces are not particularly welcoming, and there are spaces where hate and harassment are commonplace. 
It's also important to note that the studies looking at harassment, most victims report they were targeted um, because of an identifying feature of them, their race, ethnicity, religion, ability, gender, or sexual orientation. And harassment can and often is magnified if the person is a marginalized voice, if they're a minority, if they're female, if they're a member of the LGBTQIA community. Um, again, further reflecting underpinnings of perhaps racism, misogyny, homophobia as core components of toxic gamer cultures. So toxic behaviors are not something to be thought of, I would say not as deviant actions, sometimes they're called deviant actions, but that would imply that it's the exception, right? Not the norm. Uh, it's not a sporadic, occurrence. Most people who play games, probably most people in this room, I see a lot of nodding heads, um, have experienced some form or witnessed some form of hate harassment or participation um, while they played. And this normalization of hate, of toxic gamer culture, it's not just in the actions, which is what we're talking about here, but we're starting to see it in the language um, as well. And I want to talk about a new report that was published last month, I want to say. Um, it was the Anti-Defamation League in conjunction with Take This, Middlebury Institute and Gamer Saber. And we looked for the normalization of hateful and extremist language in gaming spaces, and specifically, we looked at Minecraft. We looked at over 1.4 million chat messages, and we found evidence for the normalization of extreme language in gaming spaces. Specifically, we found slurs that a couple years ago were only found in the deepest, darkest corners of the internet, um, are now being used in a way that is commonplace uh, in these spaces. And I'm going to give an example of this in the next slide, just so you are prepared. Um, although for me, I will say when I learned about this, my colleague Alex Newhouse, who I do all of my extremism work with, I had never heard this term before. He is the extremism expert, and he informed me. So the word is C-U-C-K. It's pronounced cock. And it is meant to be a very sexually demeaning word, like very inciting word. Um, and when we look at all these Minecraft servers, you can see that it's just being used as common words. Um, I, I don't think that these examples are the people meaning to use it in the way in which it was originally intended. I just think it normalized and, and, and taken in, and now it's just kind of used um, as part and parcel of chatting in Minecraft. Interestingly, this report also found that hateful messages were 21% more likely to be shared in public chats than private chats, whereas sexualized language was more likely to be shared in private chats than public chats, which I think, again, pushes this idea of hate being normalized and hate being accepted. And I won't say welcomed into, into public chat, but certainly not actively moderated in an effective way. Uh, now, as I open the talk uh, today, perhaps it's not particularly shocking for me to be like, gamer culture can be toxic. Um, I know that some people talked about this website in one of the talks I was in either today or yesterday, but like, fat, ugly, and slutty, right? That's a website that's been around for a long time, cataloging the use of hateful language in gaming spaces for some time. Um, and the fun fact here, I, I went to grab these screenshots and there's actually an entire section on this website for death threats, uh, which is horrifying. Um, now, you may see they, you may say there's something to be said about misogyny versus the normalization of extremist language that originally was only found on 4chan. Um, but again, they all contribute. They all contribute to this normalization of toxicity and to this broader societal impact of what I'm calling um, games being used as digital assets of influence, um, which we'll talk about. So, let's talk about impact. There is a gross misconception that these behaviors stay somehow magically within the walls of the game. Uh, they don't. So, let's talk about who this impacts and how. We're gonna start with the who, and then we're gonna do the how. So, who is this impacting? Who does it really impact when somebody is saying something horrible to me um, when I play first-person shooters, right? Hate and harassment has a radius of impact, actually. Uh, and there's a real gap in understanding the nature, severity, and radius of these kinds of behaviors in gaming spaces. Toxicity not only harms the person that's directly targeted, um, but the broader community of witnesses. Um, this image actually comes from the Fair Play Alliance. They call it the radius of impact. And you can see, uh, listed here, there's player communities, content moderators, game developers, game companies, influencers, teachers, caregivers, friends and family. Right? This harm can manifest either directly or indirectly. So I made a cute Canva image to illustrate how, how, how it proliferates. So there's the guy, the guy saying something mean, uh, maybe to me. Um, so it's not just about person A saying something to person B, right? It says something to person B and all these people witness it because it's happening in the lobby of a very popular game, right? So now 500 people have witnessed it. And now person A is also talking uh, to the community managers to say, hey, this horrible thing happened to me and, and what are you gonna do about it? 
Um, and then they're telling their friends and family, like this horrible thing happened to me and I'm not sure how to, how to process it. And then the community managers tell their therapist, because let's be honest, they should all have one. They should all have one. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And that's, you know, the radius. And that's a conservative radius. Um, I can only fit so many bubbles on the slide. Um, and now, before you say, Rachel, you're being dramatic, uh, I'm really not. I'm really not. You know, I am nothing but a woman of science uh, and research. And research has found that online hate harassment is associated with a range of short and long term mental health repercussions for the direct targets, as well as third party onlookers and everyone in this radius of impact. So how is the normalization of hate in gaming spaces impacting individuals and society at large? We're gonna talk about three hows, mental health, um, workplace culture, and extremism and radicalization. So first let's talk about mental health. Um, the mental health impact of these actions does not, again, magically contain itself within the walls of the gaming space. Um, it doesn't just disappear when I log off, right? I carry those moments, those meaningful moments, even if it's a negative meaningful moment, with me when I log off. Um, and research has found that these behaviors have significant mental health impacts on people's everyday lives. And when I say significant, I'm, I mean significant. Um, this comes from the 2021 ADL report. And they asked, how has online harassment impacted your mental health? And this was specifically among a population of game players. They were specifically asking about harassment in games. And one in 10 reported suicidal thoughts. Absolutely shocking when I, when I read this. The same study, there was also a range of more mild but significant mental health outcomes. So feeling uncomfortable, 77%. Increased anxiety, 62%. Feelings of isolation, almost 40%. Depression, almost 40%. PTSD symptomology was almost one quarter. It was 24%. So this is long-term trauma, PTSD. Symptomology. One in four reported the symptomology of that due to online harassment in games specifically, and again, suicidal thoughts, one in 10. So what's notable also about this is the question was, how, what was the impact either witnessing and or being a direct target? So it's not just about being the object of, of targeting, it's also about witnessing um, for your friends or for your guildies if there's something else in the gaming space. These outcomes have significant consequences outside of the gaming space, right? So suicidal thoughts, PTSD symptomology, a sense of aloneness. This impacts people's ability to work, to engage with their family and friends, you know, above and beyond any impact it might have in the gaming space, which is not feeling welcoming or not wanting to play that particular game anymore or whatever it might be. The 2021 ADL report also asked, how have your experiences of what they call disruptive behaviors impacted your day-to-day -day life? And we see here, felt uncomfortable, felt less social, felt isolated and alone. Taking steps to reduce my personal safety was nearly one in five. I mean, it, it's significant. I was, I was gobsmacked, I think is the word. Um, when I read it, I just couldn't believe it. Um, contacted the gaming company, treated people worse than usual, contacted the police was one in 10, and had schoolwork performance negatively impacted was also one in 10. So while these are individual impacts, we can very clearly see the societal repercussions of them. You know, having work or school performance negatively impacted, that is a societal repercussion, um, especially when we think about the sheer scale of one out of 10. Um, gaming communities, two and a half million players, right? Um, one in 10 are reporting this impact, that, that grows exponentially, uh, very quickly. Now, again, touching on the ways the individual outcomes can creep into social impacts, this was a Surgeon General report. I don't know if you guys saw this, in 2021, it was an excellent report, and they had a, a point there specifically about the impact of technology. It's on the opening page, actually, of the report, and it says, well, technology platforms have improved our lives in important ways. We know for many people, they can also have adverse effects. When not deployed responsibly and safely, these tools can pit us against each other, reinforce negative behaviors like bullying and exclusion, and undermine the safe and supportive environments young people need and deserve. So again, it's the individual impact on mental health from the toxic spaces and games is a societal problem contributing to these broader discussions of cyberbullying and exclusion, um, and as discussed here, a lack of safe and supportive environments.
And I don't know if you missed the memo, but we are in a mental health crisis already. <laughs> we don't necessarily need more contributing um, to the mental health crisis in America. This is a 2021 report. It says nearly a quarter of adults with mental illness have an unmet need for treatment. And youth with severe depression who receive some treatment, only 27% receive consistent care. So I don't know what proportion games or online hate harassment is contributing to this, but it is certainly contributing already to a crisis of underserved mental health care, either as a direct or an indirect contributor to distress, both short and long term. So there's workplace culture. Um, we can argue about this being a chicken and an egg problem. Did this culture start in the industry? We call it frat boy culture. There was just a new lawsuit announced today. I read right before I came in, and the lawsuit said that that term is frat boy culture. Um, and did it permeate the, cult, the game cultures of, of the players, or was it the other way around? I suppose. But regardless, the normalization of these behaviors in gaming spaces are also seen for the game makers are for the making of games. Um, this is the quote I mentioned um, earlier. Gaming industry spaces are fundamentally toxic within their structure, um, and that can perpetuate the cycle. So here's the cycle. Now, this is a terrible graph to show vertically on a horizontal screen. Um, I'm going to show it in a different way in just a minute because I know that's impossible to read. This comes from a 2017 paper uh, talking about hate and harassment in gaming cultures um, and how it starts as a gender socialization process from an early age. Uh, games are thought of as being boys' toys. There's actually a great paper from John Sherry, who's not here, I don't think. I don't know if not here. Um, who works here at MSU. Um, boys and men are encouraged from a young age to participate in games, in gaming culture, to the exclusion of everyone else, which feeds into a male-dominated game industry. Of course, if males are encouraged to participate from a young age, they will also be encouraged to participate in the industry to the exclusion of non-males. And we see this today, as the industry is still largely male-dominated which can contribute to male-centered content. So the sexualization of female characters, for instance, highly competitive games that feature violence and, and weapons, which are fine, there's nothing wrong with that, but it is a predominating theme. Uh, if it is a predominating theme, it can further exclude anyone who doesn't want that kind of content. Uh, I myself am partial to female, like a Stardew Valley situation, but you know. Anything that requires hand eye coordination is and for me, that's our team Harvey. Um, yeah, and then all of, <laughs> what? <laughs> it's our team Shane in the house. Um, and all these things can perpetuate exclusionary gaming communities, and then it's a feedback loop, right? That continues to perpetuate these processes. And while this model was discussed and created originally to talk specifically about sexism, sexism and misogyny in gaming culture, I think we can also use it as a way to understand what the more severe forms of hate, harassment, exclusion, and toxicity um, may come into the industry. Regardless of the shame or the egg, it's clear that workplace culture in games reflects toxic gamer culture ideas. Or ideals, one need not look far to see the slew of headlines around various lawsuits that have been filed in the last few years related to workplace behavior, gender discrimination, and harassment, and all of these things that would fall under the umbrella of toxic. Um, so these toxic interactions we see at the individual level, the gender socialization processes, the male-dominated industry, fuel the same behaviors at a higher systems level, right? Sexism, misogyny, racism, and vice versa. And once it's reached the population level, the whole system changes, right? And then feeds back into a loop. Um, making a terrible cycle of reinforcement, which is where I think we are today. Now again, it's not a problem that should be thought of in isolation. We know the size of the industry. We all study games here. Uh, the sheer size of the industry makes this a societal problem. Uh, this is the number of employees in the video game industry, only in the United States, uh, which is 300,000 and growing. And over the last five years, it's grown 7.4%, which I think is more than the value of my Lego collection. So I think that's quite high. Uh, we've been talking about Lego in the last few years, the price has gone up. Um, so if you think about this, plus the radius of impact, right now we're having an exponentially growing societal problem, even more with the food, uh, feedback loop situation. Uh, and that's just the industry. And yet there's more. Um, there's another societal problem to consider. And it's not an easy conversation to have, but again, I'm grateful to have this conversation. Um, I'm grateful to have Florida have this conversation. There was another talk today talking about Fallout 4 and New York. It was such a talk, it was great. Um, and it's the leveraging of toxic cultures for attitude and behavior change, specifically in the context of extremism and radicalization. Now, you may be thinking, Rachel, that escalated quickly. Uh, and you're right, except for the fact 
not so much. It's the fact that toxicity has been embedded in gamer cultures for a significant amount of time, uh, and these behaviors have been specifically linked to extremism. So research has specifically pointed out that participation in toxic, hateful online behaviors is associated with the risk of being persuaded by far-right extremist propaganda specifically. So TLDR, being entrenched in a culture that normalizes hate increases the likelihood that you too may choose uh, to adopt these thoughts and behaviors. Because when we allow hate to spread without consequence, it normalizes in all spaces. And that's what the research there was really pointing to. Participation in toxic gamer culture can lead you more vulnerable to more extreme forms of behavior, both in and out of game. And we know from years of psychological research um, that the nature of our social environment impacts the way we see and interact with the world. And that may, and many perpetrators of global funds are radicalized online first. And my, my brain is like misfiring, so it's reminding me of when I was a kid and my mom was like, who are your friends? I don't like these kids. They're smoking behind the gym. Um, because you are who, who you hang out with, right? Your social environment can change your perception of the world. Uh, and that's quite a big consequence, if you ask me. So part of this normalization, specifically in the context of extremism, has to do with gamer identities being associated with hate by the proxy of the culture it's being embedded in. So I've been on this soapbox about gamer versus player for as long as I've known Robbie, probably. I, I've been on this soapbox since, since like 2014, but here we are, still there. Um, gamer is an identity. Gamer is a social identity. A player is a temporary functional status that you get when you are interacting with the game. But a gamer is a concept that comprises long-term aspects of self-construction, of self-perception. It's how we position ourselves as an individual in society. It's how we position ourselves in relation to the broader culture. It's a social identity that we choose to adopt. So we have a lot of social identities. Um, I would consider myself a gamer, although I, I, the only game I played last year was unpacking, so I got three kids in no time, right? My mom, my mom plays Wordle every day. She would literally never call herself a gamer. These identities are important though, because they position ourselves in the world. They inform our self-perception, they embed us in our social networks. And gamer identities have been specifically linked to a range of positive you know, psychological outcomes, um, to reduce loneliness, because you're part of a social group. Even increased life satisfaction, we found that among adolescents, because our groups can give our lives meaning, our social identities are important. But the caveat is that the gamer identity um, are embedded in toxic cultures, right? And these identities have to become toxic. So I'm gonna talk about some new work that I've been doing over the last year. This paper is going to be eminently published. I'm currently in the purgatory where you did all the revisions, like add the DOI and whatever, and I'm like waiting for it to be online. So very soon this will be up. Um, I've been doing work in collaboration with the University of Texas, specifically with Alexi Martel, PhD student at Bill Swan over there, looking at a concept called identity fusion in relation to gamer identities. So we typically have our personal identity, our eyes, and our social identities, our we's, and these identities are separate. But sometimes they fuse together and the borders become more porous. And this is identity fusion. And fusion is interesting because when fusion happens, an individual is more willing to self-sacrifice for the group. You're more willing to make a personal sacrifice for the betterment um, of your group goals. Now traditionally this happens when you feel a deep emotional bond to your social group that tends to form over time through shared experiences, shared norms, close tight-knit friendship groups, um, stressful experiences are particularly great at like establishing identity fusion. And the best example I can give is my dad was a Marine. Do you know any Marines? Yeah. Those are fused identities, right? Once a Marine, always a Marine. There is no tearing apart like my dad and my dad is a Marine. And the research in fusion has focused almost exclusively on nationalist groups and military groups. But I noticed when I was reading this literature that the contributors to fusion, shared experiences, shared norms, close ties knit friendship groups, sounded like my World of Warcraft guild, <laughs> right? Um, so the, these are all experiences central to the gaming experience. So I was like, okay, let's have a look and see what fusion may look like uh, in the context of gaming. So that's what we did. And what we found is that fusion exists, but fusion also reflects the toxic nature of gamer communities. So it was associated with the willingness to fight or die. Now, to be clear, that's like the fusion elements. Like that's how you determine whether or not identity has been fused. Is this element of self-sacrifice for the betterment of the group. In this case, it was for the betterment of gamers. 
It was also associated with recent aggressive behaviors, Machiavellianism, which is a personality trait characterized by manipulation, being deceitful, cynical, and lacking morality. Narcissism, psychopathy, which in this assessment was measured as a lack of empathy. Sexism, racism, and it says here all right identity, but it really should say white nationalism because the questions were specifically to endorse the beliefs associated uh, and with the policies and beliefs with white nationalism. Notably, it was not associated with right-wing political identity, but it was associated with white nationalism, which I found to be a particularly interesting way. Um, it's also interesting to note here that age, gender, and years gaming had no effect, but gameplay time did. So these relationships were found to be significantly stronger with those who played primarily multiplayer games as well as compared to um, single-player campaigns. So to me, this suggests that playtime measure is not really like a dosage effect. I don't think it's so much reflecting like exposure to content, but exposure to cultures is my working hypothesis. So the more you spend immersed and engrossed in gamer cultures, the more likelihood you are to be exposed to more radicalized ideas, the more opportunity you have to internalize the beliefs, endorse more extreme behaviors, racism, sexism, and nationalism. So it was a series of three studies. Um, in the third study, we looked at this model in two different uh, gaming groups, so people who predominantly spent their time in different kinds of games. And what we found is that it was more persistent, this model, in groups that were found to be more socially toxic. So we looked at fusion among Call of Duty and Minecraft players. We asked them to rate how toxic you believe your social gaming environment is. Call of Duty was rated to be more socially toxic than Minecraft. Um, and we looked at averages across everyone. We looked at averages across everyone, regardless of what they played, it was, this, it was not significantly different. So their levels of racism, their levels of sexism, it was the same across the board. But when you added fusion to the model, we got that first model among Call of Duty players, and we got a more pro-social model among Minecraft players. So that does suggest that there is a difference in what kind of environment you're spending your time in and how fusion with gaming is manifesting. Is it the social toxic environment, which was my first hypothesis, but now I'm thinking, okay, maybe it's also political content. I didn't think about that. You know, Call of Duty has political undertones. Uh, it could be the idea of competitive nature of games. We've been talking at this conference several people about there's higher toxicity in a competitive versus more cooperative space, um, as we all don't think of. And this reminded me, Heidi's not here because I know she had a flight home, but it reminded me of this picture I took of her slide yesterday. Um, I'm particularly interested in delving deeper in this idea of narrative, as she said, pop culture stories and narrative archetypes can incite experiences that compel new behavioral instincts. So is there something to be said? Is there an argument to be made about narrative? Um, and, the, and I was talking about that to the people who did the follow-up research earlier as well. Now it's important to note that in the context of extremism, I'm talking about a small group, but it's a very hardened group. So that doesn't mean it's not a societal problem just because it's a small group. Um, this quote comes from Alex Newhouse, who is my research partner, and he's the deputy director of the Middlebury Institute of Counterterrorism and Extremism. And he says, extremists are using gaming platforms to radicalize and mobilize. And identity fusion are just one of the many reasons that I believe that we are seeing this. Games are being leveraged, again, at least partially, because the toxic nature of the culture facilitates messaging associated with gaming. Because when we allow games to spread without consequence, it normalizes in all spaces. Um, and again, it's a radius and it's from the individual to society. Now, before we move on to, I, I promise to end on some hopeful messaging. Um, starting with this hopeful messaging. Um, two weeks ago, I found out that my grant funding was accepted. Um, hey, thank you. Um, so I'm going to work on a tier project with Middlebury and Logically AI, uh, funded by the Department of Homeland Security, to look more at the identity fusion work and also to develop industry-wide tools to better mitigate extremism and radicalization specifically in gaming spaces. So there's some light two years down the road from here to this particular time. Um, but what do we do about it now? Uh, that's, you know, that's two years in the future. Now that we maybe realize toxic gamer culture is a bigger problem maybe than we originally thought, I have three suggestions about how we can start to denormalize hate in gaming spaces. Uh, the first is to change the environment. So basically we've created an ecosystem that is positively reinforcing uh, like the cycle model I showed you earlier that starts in early childhood, percolates to game development, game culture, online offline behaviors, and back again. 
So one way to change the cycle is to change the environment uh, and have better support for community management. Community managers are the front line. They're the hardest working person in the building. They are not there to just ban the trolls. They are there to shape the nature of the community and the culture of the community. Um, they're setting values and norms and all these things. So in our work with ABL, we actually looked at the role of community management as compared to the role of moderation. And while moderation was very effective in the short term, it's actually community management that was a, and, and server rules and the server culture that was set by them that was far more influential in determining the nature of the community in terms of the severity of the inciting language. Um, so we need to start thinking about how we can shape and guide communities, how to set up a community for success. If you're developing a new game, how do you set up that community from the ground up and set up for success? Especially since we know it can be such an influential tool in reducing this behavior. Second is advocacy and outreach. Um, it cannot be understated how little people know about games and gaming spaces. Um, I have some examples here of things that my neighbor, bless her, I love her, has said to me, like, my kid's on Discord. I'm like, okay, cool with who? I don't know, okay. Um, <laughs> how many people are on there? I don't know, right? Um, it's a problem, right? We need to be better advocates of information um, to better explain, you know, what is toxic culture in games? What can you do about it? Where are the reporting tools? Where are the resources? Really, like, basic, bare bones uh, information. And, and if you think about cyberbullying as a model, it took a long time to kind of get parents up to speed about that, but weirdly, games seem to be like a black box. You know, my kid, you know, is playing games and he's getting really angry and I don't know what's going on. Ask him. I don't know. Ask him what's going on. Um, it's part of the ecosystem. And there just seems to be like this disconnect. So we need to be better as, as advocates. Um, for letting people know, and, and media literacy, we talk about that at this conference too. Lastly, research partnerships. You know, self-regulation and self-policing may not work in a place where there's a direct conflict of interest, probably. Um, game companies do a lot of work within their own walls, but it's proprietary. It can be helpful for the individual's walls in which that work is happening, um, but it's less helpful for the whole industry. So we've got to start working together, industry, academia, outside voices, um, it's got to be generalizable, it's got to be open source, it's got to be a movement, you know, we know it can work. Like that work with Minecraft that I did, like it took a village, right? It took a whole bunch of people to work together, and now we have created a report that indies can use and, and devs that maybe don't have the resources to do their own research. They can learn, oh look, you know, server rules are more effective in moderation in the long term. Like that's a very important thing to know, especially when you're developing a new community. Um, so if we want to get to a place where hate is not normalized, here are some places we can start in the industry with supporting community managers, or advocacy uh, with the community, and through research collaboratively. So returning to the beginning, we need to start thinking about toxic gamer cultures as not just being harmful to other players, I want to amend my definition slightly, um, but harmful to others. It goes beyond the gaming sphere, it is not contained within our virtual walls. Uh, this is actually a formal definition I'm putting forward in upcoming papers. So if you want to cite it, you can. Um, it's harmful within and outside of the game sphere, within and outside of game communities. There's a radius of impact um, from the individual to the group to society. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Woo!